We're going to explore the idea of the soul. And the soul is obviously a very ancient idea. The Egyptians obviously had a very sort of elaborate notion of soul. But if we think back about their idea, we see that the soul was fairly material. It was the kind of thing that left the body and would take a journey, you know, through the pyramid and out into the afterworld. And that it would be able to enjoy certain aspects of material life as well. Um, if we fast forward from the Egyptians to the ancient Greeks and we think about the pre-Socratics, those sort of early philosophers and scientists, they thought about the soul as a kind of breath of life. They called it pneuma. This pneuma was a kind of uh, element that energized the other elements of earth, air, fire, and water. Uh, it made living things different from inanimate things. Uh, if we fast forward a little further, we begin to see that uh, the Pythagoreans, uh, the mathematicians of the era, began to think that the mind was really the soul, and that the mind grasped things like mathematics and pure ideas. Uh, what this did was influence Plato dramatically. Plato was influenced by the Pythagoreans in the sense that he thought the soul was totally immaterial. Unlike earth, air, fire, and water, it would leave the body and have no connection to the earthly realm. This is the idea that religion continued in the Christian world. Aristotle, though, who was Plato's student, uh, saw things differently. He was a bit of a scientist on this question, and he thought about the soul as having three levels. First, we have the nutritive soul, which is something that plants have, for example. They take in nutrition, they grow. He thought this was a crucial part of the living creature. Next, you have a level up from that called the sensate soul, and also the locomotive soul. So this is what animals have. They can feel pain, they can feel pleasure, and they can move about. Lastly, we have a creature that has the first two levels of soul, and a third and higher level of soul, basically the mind or the intellect. This is what human beings have, and only human beings, according to Aristotle. This idea of the soul as a natural aspect of nature was the one that the sciences began to cultivate and develop later uh, in the scientific revolution. We're going to examine all these aspects of soul in this discussion. So the ancient Greek and Roman understanding of the soul form the foundation for the way in which people within the Western Christian tradition found meaning in their life. Let me try to explain that. So with Thomas Aquinas, the eminent theologian and philosopher of the medieval age, the soul was defined by a combination of the Aristotelian understanding of the natural soul and the Platonic understanding of the soul as a independent entity, reality, outside the range of the physical world. So purpose and meaning in human life now becomes the ability of the soul upon death to transcend matter and to experience the beatific vision, the presence of the immortal God, of the, of the soul of souls for all eternity. And this meaning then found a activist modality in the person of Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order in the 16th century, who sent his members of his order acro out across the world in search of souls to be saved. And that then added to the meaning of one's life, founding the foundation of it again being the immortal soul. With Charles Darwin in the 19th century, this whole edifice collapsed because Darwin, through in his theory of evolution and natural selection, was able to establish a naturalist and materialist understanding of where we came from as a species and who we are. So that meaning derived from that and the yearning of, the, of human beings for a different world derived within that natural order. And you don't have to agree with Karl Marx's analysis of human history to realize there's something dramatically and drastically wrong with the world today and that meaning can have its highest expression in one's commitment to try to change that and to bring into being a different world order. There are two concepts that have revolutionized our ability to answer the question of what is the soul, does the soul exist? Those concepts are evolution and neuroscience. These methods have allowed us to go beyond uh, the philosophers we've heard of already, the ancient philosophers and the uh, theologians. Neuroscience has allowed us to see how the brain 
accomplishes what the soul was supposed to do. For example, Aristotle spoke of the soul as having three elements, a nutritive element, a sensitive element, and an intellectual element. But now we know that the brain actually accomplishes all of those functions. For example, the nutritive soul, we now know, is the midbrain and the brainstem. Whereas the sensitive soul is the limbic cortex. And the intellectual soul of Aristotle is the neocortex. So what we've been able to do through evolution in neuroscience is naturalize all of these elements that the soul was supposed to accomplish in a disembodied way in the context of evolution and material substance. One of the things that happens uh, after we understand the brain uh, with neuroscience is that for many people the idea of the soul goes away entirely. Uh, if we can understand the nuts and bolts of how the mind works according to neuroscience, why do we need a concept of the soul? And that has been a sort of 20th century way of thinking about the soul. I want to submit that there's another way to think about retaining soul talk intelligently. We don't have to think about it as a sort of miraculous ghost in the machine, like a supernatural entity that uh, sort of moves about inside the brain. We can think about it within the context of neuroscience. For example, um, we have a very rich and elaborate emotional life. We know that uh, in the brain this is dominated by the limbic system. We understand this fairly well. It seems to me that we can retain ideas of the soul in sort of expressing this domain of human life, the emotional life. So for example, people will talk about having a soul mate or we'll talk about soul music or this uh, nature hike was good for my soul or something like this. Uh, these are ways of talking intelligently and meaningfully about a natural existence without sort of going supernatural. Uh, but it also acknowledges that there are aspects of the human condition that can't be reduced down to scientific language. So for those things, I think the idea of the soul can still be preserved in an intelligent way in our culture. So I want to say just a quick word about soul talk. So clearly, to use the term soul, even though such a thing as an immortal soul doesn't exist, to use the term soul, referring to soulmate, has a common sense meaning to it. But there's a point, uh, using the word soul, that can get confusing in people's lives who are searching for meaning. And of course, there's a legitimate way to do that. But what I want to stress is the fact that it can also be used, the term soul or other such terms about things that don't really exist, to make people feel comfortable in situations in which they don't know what's going on and don't know what to do. And it's very, very important to be able to point to what the actual truth is in people's lives so that they can understand what is happening to them and act upon it. I have more of a skeptical view of why we have soul talk and why we even believe in the soul. I think that the mind evolved, many parts of the mind evolved for social purposes, such that we naturally see the world as populated by other creatures like ourselves. And there's been a lot of research in developmental psychology and cognitive psychology about what these brain processes are. We know that there's a part of the brain, part of the mind, um, that about age four gets turned on. It's called the theory of mind mechanism. And it allows us to see other creatures as being pushed and pulled by beliefs and desires. We also have parts of the brain, some people call it the left hemisphere interpreter, which is said to interpret information into some sort of narrative. And there are others. But the point is that there are parts of the brain that evolved for social purposes that we may be overgeneralizing. That is, we might be using these processes for the wrong task. That is, we are using these processes to make up metaphysical explanations of is there a God out there? Uh, do we have something more to, more to us than just our bodies? Uh, and what I think is this is a mistake due to the way we evolved and we're using the wrong tools um, for the question of the soul. All through the history of Western culture, of course, the soul has been connected to the meaning question. What is the meaning of life? And ordinarily, it's been tied to this idea of an afterlife, that the immortal soul will go on and on. 
Now we're living in the scientific era that's not quite as compelling as it was for many people as it used to be. Um, that doesn't mean, however, that we're left with uh, nihilism, you know, the idea that nothing is meaningful, we're, we're sort of cast about uh, like a rock around the sun and it's an empty universe devoid of values. My own view is that the soul talk can still be used uh, to apply to the core values of human beings and these core values will be quite local and specific having to do with you know your own family, your kin and kith, your tribe, uh, things like love, marriage, children, work. These very proximate kinds of experiences make up the meaning of life and can be uh, substantial and significant even if the larger theological view of the soul is gone. So the meaning of life is not compromised once we let go of some of the metaphysical ideas. That's still there for us. When we talk about the soul, if we're going to use that language, we sort of basically use it to describe these core values and ideas. So I'm not one for the big global metaphysical notions of the meaning of life, but rather the very precise and local things, of your, your own family, this kind of thing. And that's where I think soul talk is still relevant today. I want to say a word about the way in which the local has become global. That with the development of a globalized economy and with the development of communication circuits, around the world, the, it is very, very important that we take into account when we're thinking about ourselves and about other people and about the direction that the world is going in, to put the whole world first in our thinking. So our empathy is capable, our empathetic instincts are capable of looking to the world, of looking to the Congo, of looking to Haiti, of looking to the Arab Spring of looking to the levels of poverty and the disparity between the rich and the poor and understand that this is a global phenomenon that's only going to be solved with, by a global reach. And so it, we shouldn't be shying away from, from the meaning that we can be giving to our lives that could be expressed in the term emancipators of humanity. We need to be so bold as to take that as being a, a, a something to, that could define us and define the meaning of our lives and what we can do about the world. I think there can be meaning in a soulless universe, you know, with the community, with your family, um, and I think also with certain activities, that is, traditional activities, you know, um, ways of engaging in the human, the longer, the bigger human community, your history, um, but also activities like art, which, hold, I think, two, two ways of, of um, finding meaning. One is this, basically, it's a humanistic enterprise because we engage emotionally with other people at a meaningful level. Uh, the other way is that uh, art has possibilities of transcendental moments. That is, what we usually call soulful or, or spirituality can be attained in art in what many people see as a, not, a kind of secular um, approach to meaning. Um, so in those two ways, I think we can still have meaning in a humanistic, uh, non-spiritual, non-soul-like um, atmosphere. All of this adds up to is that we don't need the soul. We can talk about the brain. The brain does the same thing that the soul used to do. And it doesn't mean that life is meaningless if there is no soul. There are other ways of achieving it. There's local meaning in your family, local meaning in traditional activities, and there's also global meanings you can have by connecting to people that you've never met, having empathy for a wide range of people. So humans are not so much in danger from neuroscience and science and 20th century um, findings, but the word soul, the concept of non-material stuff is in danger, uh, and um, that's fine.